1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing it on a gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders, all of you. Close yourself with humility towards another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. Hi, Avenue. It's lovely to be with you as we go through this next part of 1 Peter together. Um, as we start, I'd like you to think of a leader. A any leader that you might know of, someone you've met or someone you, you just know of. Uh, it could be anyone, a politician, a uh, business leader. Uh, someone you've worked with, a church leader, a sports person, a friend, anyone. I wonder who comes to mind for you? Uh, maybe someone you admire, someone you look up to and value as a leader. Maybe someone you absolutely don't admire, someone you feel personifies all that a leader shouldn't be. I wonder what came to mind for you. You could look, look in the news uh, even just in the last week or two, couldn't you? And you could find plenty of examples uh, of both of those categories and sadly no matter what sphere of life you picked from including from church leaders there would be plenty of examples of people who have misused their leadership and authority and caused personal uh, and collective damage as a result. Our passage today has Peter set out a picture of what godly leadership should look like. It's not the only passage in the New Testament that talks of leadership and it's not exhaustive um, but here Peter sets out some key attributes for the Christian leader. His focus is on uh, not on specific things that they do but on attitude and uh, conduct for Christian leaders. So look in the passage down to verse 1 you immediately see that he's addressing elders. He says to the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. He re writes two elders uh, as an elder himself as a church leader. Uh, here specifically writing to, we don't know much about the churches uh, in the area he's writing, but writing to these young and growing churches in the communities he's writing to. Uh, and then in verse five, at the end of our passage for today, uh, he turns to everyone else in the church and says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit to your elders. Now, you who are younger could literally mean younger in years. But I think that the best understanding is that verse one is addressing leaders. And then in verse five, we get the link in the same way, showing that Peter's continuing that same theme. And at that point, he turns from the leaders to those who sit under their leadership. So he says, leaders lead like this. Everyone else sit under their leadership like this. So as we work through this passage today, uh, our primary application, at least for verses one to four, is to elders, to the elders, and therefore at Avenue, the Avenue elders. It's instructing us as to what our attitude should and shouldn't be. For those of you at Avenue but who don't know who the elders are, that's probably useful. Uh, there are six of us. There's, there's Richard and Dan, who are full-time and paid as members of staff, but they're two of the elders, and then Paul Webster, Dan Jones, Matt Wallace, uh, and me. And this passage speaks very directly to those six men who you, if you remember, have voted to become elders. Uh, but the fact that you're not an elder doesn't mean that now is the time to go and put the kettle on and switch off. This passage uh, is for all of us. Um, it tells us a number of things that are helpful. First of all, actually, it tells us the sort of men that we should appoint as elders. So uh, you might be in future, if you're a member again, you'll be voting on who should be an elder. And this tells us who we should be looking for, the sort of person we should look for. Um, we can never know everything about a person, of course, but um, we need to appoint people who model the attitudes described here. Uh, Peter would say, don't go and appoint an elder if their attitude doesn't align with these descriptions. Similarly, you might become an elder in future. Perhaps you uh, already see that as a way that you would like to serve or that God might have for you serving in the future. And that's a godly hope to have. Um, this passage sets out what attitude and what conduct you should be developing right now. Uh, the attitudes and the, and the conduct that we see here are not something that are switched on once someone starts in leadership. Um, instead, I think leadership comes because those things are already being demonstrated in our lives. 
So it applies to elders, it applies to future elders, it applies to our choice of elders. But I think we can also expand it to, to look at the principles that it tells us about Christian leadership and in fact Christian life generally. But think of any one of you involved in any form of, of leadership. Peter's emphasis here, again, isn't on specific tasks, though he talks to elders, it's on character um, and conduct. So I think that can apply to all of us in any sort of leadership role. So where do you serve as a leader? Perhaps home groups, uh, children's and, and youth groups, uh, camps at uh, Hungerton or elsewhere in the country, uh, the music team, whatever it might be, whatever areas of, of service you have now or will take on in the future, I think this, pas this passage speaks to us about our attitude and our conduct if we're going to be godly leaders. So let's dive in and see what it's got for us. First, we see as an overarching principle that the elders, the leaders, are to be the shepherds of God's flocks. So if you look at verse two, Peter writes, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, or your translation might have, serving as overseers. And as I say, this is, if you like, the overarching principle for godly leadership. Leaders are to be shepherds, to be shepherding God's people. And God's people, all of us, are the sheep. So the, the job of the shepherd described here is to, to watch over, to oversee the sheep. Like a good shepherd keeps a watchful eye over their flock to protect them and lead them to the place that's best for them. Leaders are to do the job of shepherding their people, God's people, the flock. Uh, crucially, we all do that, regardless of our position in the church, we all do that under one chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus. We are under him, and as verse 4 puts it, uh, he is the chief shepherd he was peter's chief shepherd he's our chief shepherd uh, jesus himself called himself the good shepherd didn't he and we are all his sheep so elders in a local church are under shepherds underneath jesus the chief shepherd in caring for his god's people um, and we're to serve now verse 4 says with the future prize in mind that crown of glory that will never fade that's to be part of our motivation now as we serve Jesus, looking forward to that in the future. So, Peter says, leaders, shepherd God's flock, the flock that's under your care. In a nutshell, that is the role of the Christian elder, the Christian leader. Um, and we can broaden that, as I say, to leadership more widely. And then what follows in the next couple of verses is uh, descriptions of three specific attitudes and which must characterise uh, the Christian leader. Um, the way in which elders ought to shepherd and lead their people. And each of these three has a positive and a negative. Again, the primary application is to elders, but I'd encourage you, whatever position you're in now or might be in the future, these attitudes are for us all. The first of the three attitudes is this, serve willingly, not reluctantly. Serve willingly, not reluctantly. So verse two, serve not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. God wants us to be willing in our Christian leadership. Our actions, our serving are to be willing, not begrudging because we feel we ought to. Now, of course, there are obligations, aren't there, of, of any leadership, uh, things that we have to do, things that we might prefer not to do, but we ought to do because of our role. The point here is about our overall attitude. Am I willing to serve? Am I keen to serve as God wants me to be? Do I have a genuine desire to serve God and his people, to care for his flock? Or am I doing it or would I do it just because I feel I ought to? Now that's not always an easy balance, is it? Uh, doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, even though sometimes I might rather not, that can be a valid part, a right part of our motivation when we serve. But it shouldn't be the only part, should it? If, if all it comes down to is, oh, I ought to, I feel I should, then our desire is not right. We should have a desire to serve. We're told that's got what God wants of us. We shouldn't be reluctant. A reluctant shepherd will be a half-hearted shepherd. They won't put their life on the line for his sheep. We are not to be half-hearted and reluctant in our leadership of God's flock. So one really practical application there, let's make sure that the men that we appoint to eldership are people who are willing to do it. Men who want to serve God's people in that way. Let's not force someone against their will. Um, and practically, again, can I ask you, please pray for your elders. Pray for those six men that I mentioned. 
Uh, that's an application I could come to again and again in this passage. The more time I spend thinking about it, the more I think, gosh, I need God's help and transformation to make me anything like the leader that he would want me to be. Uh, and without prayer and dependence ourselves and from others, dependence on God, our leadership is only our best efforts, our best endeavours. And we need God to be uh, at work in our leaders, in us all. So, so would you specifically pray with this verse in mind, pray that elders would be willing to serve, willing to continue to serve, uh, not get weary and reluctant. Pray that we would be all in rather than half-hearted. Maybe you hope one day to be an elder. And so already that can be a good desire to have. If that's you, pray for yourself that you would want that for the right reasons. Pray that God would grow in you that willingness to serve. Maybe it's not eldership. Maybe it's some other way of serving. Again, pray that God would grow in you that desire to do that for the right reasons. A love for his people, a love for the lost so that you would serve him for the right reasons. What about the rest of you? Maybe you're not thinking of an elder, being an elder or whatever. But what does it mean if you're asked, for example, to take on a leadership role of some sort? Uh, perhaps you're asked if you would lead a home group or get involved in the youth work, the children's work or reading the Bible with a teenager, or joining the eldership, as I've said, would you say yes? Should you say yes? Well, we should examine our attitude. Am I willing? Am I willing to serve? Do I see it as something that I can do for God and for his flock? Or would I only do it reluctantly, resenting uh, the time it takes, doing it begrudgingly? I guess for most of us, it's not as clear cut as that. Part of me wants to say yes to doing something. Part of me worries that my motivation might be wrong, or maybe I won't be good enough to do it. I imagine that for most of us currently in any sort of leadership role, that, that we feel a bit of that mixed emotion. Um, I also wonder if we're going to see this or feel this, perhaps particularly in a challenging way in the next few months. Um, where God willing, with COVID moving forward, uh, we'll be able to start meeting together face to face again. I wonder if that might bring this challenge in a different way. Maybe some of us, perhaps many of us, I don't know, have come to really enjoy the freedom uh, from rotors and commitments that the last year has brought. I'm sure there are things we've missed. I really hope and pray that there are. But ooh, no getting up to Avenue for nine o'clock to set up music and PA. No tea and coffee to serve, no crash to run, no floors to sweep or chairs to put away, no awkward moments after the service when I really want to talk to a friend, but oh, this person is next to me and perhaps I ought to talk to them. Instead of that, sitting back on my comfy sofa with a cup of coffee in hand and, and the church service is brought to me. There might be something in that that you've really enjoyed. I really hope that the stuff that you've missed, but perhaps rotors and commitment to serving isn't one of them. But as we move forward, we're going to need people to re-engage in those things, perhaps to engage in them for the first time and in a fresh way. So how will you respond uh, when we ask for that, when we ask people to step up and to serve again? How do you feel now when we, we ask, as we have in recent weeks, would you be willing to read the Bible with a teenager or get involved with Ace or Line or whatever it might be? Will you serve and will you do so willingly or only reluctantly? Peter says, serve because you're willing, not because you must. So examine your hearts, examine, I need to examine my heart, whether we're currently in any position of leadership or not, pray about our attitude. If we recognise that reluctance, that begrudging spirit, pray that God would grow in us genuinely a deeper love for his people and ability to serve him um, wholeheartedly and genuinely. So serve willingly, not reluctantly. Secondly, serve eagerly, not greedily. Serve eagerly, not greedily. Again, verse two, Peter says we should serve not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Your translation may have not greedy for money. It seems that uh, in some of the churches that Peter is, uh, has in mind as he's writing, there were people who attempted to carry on in positions of leadership or take up positions of leadership because of the money that they might get. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that there is not a great deal of financial gain from being an elder at Avenue. Um, but, but actually, seriously, I, I would say that there are real blessings that I enjoy, um, that we enjoy, don't we, as leaders, as we serve and as we get involved in different things. Uh, it's been a privilege, definitely, to serve alongside current and previous elders in the times that I've been doing it. And um, I can assure you that Avenue is an absolutely wonderful church, to, uh, church family to, to, to shepherd and to be involved with. But the point here is that we shouldn't be doing our leadership because of what's in it for us. 
Leadership, whether as an elder or any other role, is about serving others, not about being self-serving. We should be serve. We should serve eagerly, not greedily. Again, that's not likely to be money, but if it isn't money, what's it going to be? And what other ways could we gain personally or serve ourselves through positions of leadership? I don't know what it might be for you, but perhaps you're aware you could think of some temptations. Maybe maybe knowledge, information about people and situations that puts us in a position of power or information. Or, I don't know, the influence that, that, that leadership can bring. Or respect and appreciation from other people for all the effort that we put in. Oh, how wonderful you are. Or perhaps we give ourselves positions to be in the limelight. I don't know what it might be, but our hearts are fickle things, aren't they? And when it comes to ways to pervert something that should be good, our hearts can be very creative. So please, again, pray for the eldership, pray for, for everyone in leadership, that we would serve eagerly, not greedily, that we would do it sincerely for the sake of others and for God, not for ourselves and whatever benefit we think we can get from it, whatever that might look like. So serve eagerly not greedily and then the third of our three attributes is this serve as examples not egotists serve as examples not egotists the worst examples of leadership in any part of the world look uh, look terrible don't they? you see people mistreating their power mistreating their position whether that's dodgy politicians, business leaders, teachers, sports coaches, church leaders, whatever. Abuse of power is exactly that. It's an abuse. And it is not to be like that for the Christian leader. Verse three, Peter says that we should serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. We are to be living examples of what it means to live for Jesus. We're not to be bringing attention to ourselves, making it about me or, or lording my authority over others. Heavy handed or self-serving leadership is not to be the way of Christian leaders. And in this, Jesus is our ultimate example. Jesus, the servant king who came not to serve, but to not to, to, to be served, but to serve. Think of that wonderful description in Philippians 2 of him completely humbling himself despite his authoritative position. And he takes the nature of a servant to do God's will. Jesus came to serve, not be served. And it should be the same pattern uh, for us. Now, that idea of living as an example, that's a huge challenge to us, isn't it? Regardless of any positions of leadership, to be a living example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, but Peter said to us back in chapter three that, that people will be asking us for a reason for the hope that we have. And that's got to come, hasn't it? At least in part, because we live an example. We live a life that looks different to other people. So whether it's outside the church or inside the church, Peter says, be an example, leaders, but everyone, leaders and everyone else, be an example to the flock. So our leadership is to be free of, of domineering behaviour, of dictating, of demanding we're not to shirk away either from jobs that we don't fancy. We're not to, to use our positions as leaders to say, oh, you do that stuff. I don't fancy that. You do the behind the scenes so I can do the upfront obvious stuff that everyone notices and appreciates. No, we mustn't be like that. It's right, for example, that when we meet together in person again, it's right that the elders are there sweeping the floors and putting away chairs and, and whatever else. And we're to do that, all of us, elders or otherwise, without thinking, why can't they stop talking and, and come and be useful? But at the same time as leaders serving, we should all be serving. Leaders can abuse their power, can't they? We've said that. Of course, that's kept the case. But willing, eager leaders can also be abused, can't they? People can expect too much of the pastor or other staff members or, or those who will just always serve week after week, day after day after day. And we can become reliant on, on the 20% or perhaps less who do the 80% or perhaps more of the things that need to be done. We can become comfortable, even lazy, and, and leave others to do it. We can, we can leave the chairs and the sweeping up because someone else will do it. It always happens. Or we can wait for others to meet with the teenagers or get involved in children's work rather than get involved ourselves. There is no place in the Christian church, in the Christian life, for selective task blindness we shouldn't have that in our church family we are all sheep together and we are all to serve together yes under the chief shepherd yes under the elder shepherds that he appoints but we are all to be involved in in this and, and as we do so be examples of jesus 
So again, please pray for the elders and pray for others in positions of leadership. Pray for yourself as well. Left to our own devices, I know this certainly for me, I'm sure it's true for you, we will be anything but the right example, won't we? We need God's power, God's transforming work in our lives to make us the men and women he would have us be so that we are examples in a positive way of Jesus to the outside world uh, and, and to each other. So to recap, to elders and to other leaders, shepherd God's flock. Do so willingly, not reluctantly. Do so eagerly, not greedily. And as examples, not egotists. Now, I hope that might sound like the sort of leadership, the sort of leaders that you could follow. Imperfect leaders, yes, but leaders following Jesus's self-sacrificial example as they try to care for God's flock. And it's that idea of following leaders that Peter turns to in, in just the last verse. Um, the attitude that we should all have as we sit under the leadership of elders. And the point is this, be humble and submit to your elders. Be humble and submit to your elders. So verse five, young men in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. I, I said right at the beginning, I think this is best understood, not as young men, as in literally younger, but it's men, it's, it's those who are leading. And then this is the rest of the church, those who are under their leaders. At the same time, I, I found myself thinking, perhaps having had experience of being a young man, um, perhaps there's a reason why particularly young men might be mentioned. Uh, and perhaps it's it's young men sometimes who might particularly need to hear that call to be humble and to sit under leadership, to accept leadership and not always think uh, that we know best. But the point isn't just to young men, it's to everyone sitting under church leadership. The point is this, whatever your situation, submit to your leaders, submit to the elder shepherds, over us. I wonder how you feel about that. That word submission is quite a powerful and emotive one often, isn't it? How do you feel about submitting to leaders? And if I can ask this question without feeling completely self-conscious, how do you feel specifically about submitting to the elders of Avenue, if Avenue is your church family? Submitting isn't always easy, is it? Uh, I guess it's one thing if we respect people and we agree with the decisions that they're making, but, but when they make, quite frankly, crazy decisions, then submitting becomes rather harder, doesn't it? Maybe our COVID times currently are quite a good example of this. I, I know some people at Avenue will think that we've been too cautious in our plans to get together and meet face to face again. Uh, some, some of you might think that we should ignore what the mayor says currently. We should, we should meet anyway because we're entitled to and we should, and that's important. Others will think, on the other hand, that we've been too risky. We haven't been cautious enough that we shouldn't have met face to face at all yet. And we should wait until we're further down the road and more people have had the vaccine and so on and so forth. There are different opinions and different opinions on those topics and endless topics are fine. I hope it's really clear to you that as an eldership, we, we genuinely want to hear from different people on their different opinions about all sorts of different topics in church life. This is not about just taking the party line, just being yes men and women and keeping your mouth shut. What it's about, I think, is is actually the same as with leadership. It's about our attitude. It's about what's going on in our hearts. That as it comes to following leadership, we've got to ask ourselves, what is going on in my heart when I come across leadership and the need to submit? Do I want to be constructive or destructive? Am I open-minded to hear from others or closed-minded with my own correct views? Ultimately, when decisions are made by the eldership, will I accept it and submit or will I chunter away in the background and see if I can stir up some supporters for my point of view? Now, I am very pleased to say I really don't think that those views are prevalent at Avenue. Please don't misunderstand me. It is genuinely a joy to serve as an elder. Uh, you make it really easy as a church family. But we should be alert to the potential pitfalls that we might stumble into. Submission isn't easy and we should pray for our leaders and we should pray for ourselves in sitting under that leadership because it takes humility, doesn't it? And that's where Peter finishes in verse five. Uh, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. All of you, everyone, leader or not, clothe yourself with humility, Peter says. It's like putting on a coat or a warm blanket, wrap yourselves in humility. Are you a leader? Be humble. Leaders are not to think that they are better than others or to look down on others. We are all sheep. We are all sheep under Jesus, our chief 
shepherd. So if you're a leader, be humble. Are you under leaders? Well, be humble. We're not to go around thinking, I'd do a better job if I was an elder or if I was an elder, I'd do such and such. We are to be humble and to accept that we need leading, that we need protecting, that we need watching over. Again, God tells us we are sheep. So we're sheep. So in every situation, in every relationship, be humble. Be humble in our attitudes, not just to leadership, but in our attitudes uh, towards everyone. Treat everyone with humility and respect. Again, that proverb, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We are not to play the games that the world plays of trying to puff ourselves up while pushing others down. Our confidence shouldn't come from that. Our confidence comes from who we are in Jesus. We are his sheep, all of us. That's totally unifying. We are clumsy, messy, mucky, needy sheep in need of a mighty protector and a mighty overseer. There is no room for pride. But actually, there is boasting. There can be boasting in Jesus and his amazing salvation, not in ourselves, not in what we've achieved, not in our own leadership or anything else, but we can be uh, in him. We are, we, if we boast at all, we boast in Jesus because of what he has most wonderfully done for us. <laughs>